Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Hey, wildlings. If we've learned one thing in our little journey together, it's that whenever people get together, there are always stories. Some use these as lessons, others as archives of their local history. Still others use them as ways to remember what most seem dead set on forgetting. The intellectual and the academic may sneer at folk tales, but we need to keep in mind that humans rarely ever do or tell anything without reason. Today's hair-raising remembrance, The Pit, by terribly talented, muted vocal. One, my town is one of those backcountry, middle-of-nowhere places in which word-of-mouth folklore and wild superstition defines its entire population. It's the kind of place a visitor might hear ethereal music in the woods or catch a glimpse of an out-of-place animal roaming the empty fields. If your senses are attuned to such things, you might even notice strange graves carved into the slopes of gullies or ropes tied to the limbs of withered trees, their trunks riddled with bullet holes. But we know of something else. Ineffable horrors dwelling in the depths of the abandoned, isolated coal mine. Legends tell of a pit, a dark place in which some 300 miners lost their lives in a colliery disaster over a century ago. So the story goes, a number of miners had complained about the perilous conditions in the mine on several occasions, many citing bad omens, including the presence of carrion crows in the subterranean depths, and some even claiming to hear the unlikely neighing of startled horses in the ghastly myriad passageways. But the miners' pleas went unhurt, resulting in the catastrophic explosion that led directly to their deaths. Whispers exchanged over an ale at the painter's greyhound tell of survivors. Starving miners entombed in labyrinthine tunnels honeycombing the cold earth beneath our own. Occasionally, the ground opens up and swallows things, dilapidated sheds and the corners of houses, sometimes people. Fodder for the ravenous miners, and pets abandon their owners. Dogs disappearing into shadowy recesses and cats straying deep into the wilderness never to be seen again. As the saying goes here in my town, all victims of the pit, too. The location of the pit over the course of a century was mostly forgotten. Knowledge of the disaster itself was conveniently buried by those with more pressing political concerns and financial interests. The uh, Audes, as they're known in these parts, are still in possession of memories and often recount unsettling tales passed down through the generations. If it hadn't been for my grandfather, I, at the tender age of 14, might never have set out to find the pit that day. The route related to me was both protracted and disorienting. Seekers at the pit must first descend into the old ravine, my grandfather muttered through false teeth. A route at one time, commonly frequented by my sort. Follow the oaks and the silver birches along the old trail marked by the red bricks of the scout's cottage, and you'll reach the bald hills. You know the bonnies, don't you, boy? I nodded, uh, because I did know the bonnies, and I still do. Unnatural rocks carved out by the long-perished miners, barren and unwelcoming, suggestive of untold mysteries, and the forbidden knowledge they serve to protect. That awkward terrain, boy coupled with those dark ponds can lead one to the dogwood, a forested area intersected by confusing abandoned lanes leading deep into what we call the sterile art of the backcountry. You'll know dogwood by the density of the underbrush, though you'll have to look closely if you want to find the accursed entrance. To this day, I still don't fully understand why my grandfather encouraged me to seek it out. His warning as I left that day often returns to me on dark, foreboding autumn afternoons. 
before. Tis nothing to look. Tis everything to see. See yourself, and know they escape the darkness. But I was just a 14-year-old lad. How was I to know what he meant? Three. My best friend, Key, knocked at my door at 7.15 a.m. that fateful October morning. We walked to the length of Park Road and plunged headlong into the old ravine. The thing we sought somehow was already with us and was working to discourage us descending upon the golden brown foliage in the form of mist. But we pressed on. The discovery of the silver birches was fortuitous, for beyond them we soon observed the red bricks of Scooth's derelict moss and creeping ivy caressed the old stones joylessly, consuming what had once been the jewel of the ravine. Just like Scooth, its time had passed. The cool morning air met us as we climbed the slopes and stepped out onto the bonnies, also known as the Boldios. It's quite a thing to experience both absence and evidence of man simultaneously, but that was just how it was, standing there on the old rocks, a man-made landscape, abandoned, nature working to reclaim what it once possessed. The gravelly mounds hissed at us, exposed to the brisk autumnal wind. Key and I traversed the hills hastily, avoiding the ponds, motionless bodies of water concealing horrible depths, depths rumored to connect directly to the old tunnels, flooded passageways where the survivors were said to roam. In a moment of hesitation, we shuddered. We saw the tree line on the horizon, dense foliage forming a seemingly impenetrable wall. A cloud of mist hovered above the forest threateningly. It whispered, But we didn't turn back. We happened upon that most sought-after location, Dogwood. For, brushing the nettles and the brambles aside, we discovered an old pathway, the tiniest amount of gravel still visible beneath the grass and weeds. Mist shielded much of what lay beyond, so we stepped onto the path and made the conscious decision to keep to it. Deeper and deeper we drove into the underbrush, working hard to clear the path of shrubbery and other hindrances, blind to the inherent dangers one should be aware of in the proximity of a disused coal mine. A capped shaft presented itself as such a danger, several rotten timber planks straddling its hideous mouth. Luck was to thank for preventing an unfortunate tumble into the blackness beneath. The remains of an old railway line brushed against our boots as we closed in on our destination, the innumerable limbs of large trees clawing at the rusty tracks zealously. Key was the first to notice the change in the air, a staleness, a rancidity that had visibly affected the flora of the wood. As we neared its source, we saw fewer and fewer nettles, brambles, and ferns, vegetation in general seemingly afraid to flourish in what my grandfather referred to as the sterile heart of the back country. The withered trees stood defiantly, though the souls the roots might once have harbored had long since departed. Even the soil, gelatinous mud, had been affected by the otherworldly blight. And then we saw it, the great arch marking the entrance to the site of the pit. The arch, an iron monstrosity, once held the name of the mine, though, upon our observations, the bold lettering had mostly eroded. Three rust-nibbled letters remained. P-I-T. Trepidation begged us to flee, to return to the familiar comforts of home. The quiet town center, host to Marge's sandwich shop and Gilbert's news agents, the ancient sprawling cemetery on Church Street and Pollock's School for the Deaf under the willows of Grundy Street. Even the lone silhouette of Lightning Tree standing atop Broomhead's Hill was an image I would have happily traded for that of the dark, deathly visage of deepest dogwood. We trudged onwards until we came upon the mirror. It filled us with dread. My father, a regular up at Painter's Greyhound, said the seniors often spoke of an old mirror, a pond but a stone's throw away from the pit. Allegedly, the old miners used to wash their hands and faces in it, steadily darkening the water with coal. Other kids in times gone by who had set out in search of the mine had happened upon the mirror. 
Alarmed by the shade of the water, most had turned back, though some strayed too near and were never seen again. One lad, the uh, Audis would say, had caught a glimpse of something strange in the still water, and in the grip of some inexplicable mania, fled and threw himself into the pit. Witnesses, two of them, returned from the wood in a near catatonic state, claiming that the lad was pulled into the mouth by dark, ashen hands. The lad, like the others, was never seen again, and there was no investigation into his disappearance. The Audis said the land was cursed. That there me is a flexion of that there pit. That lad should have kept his eyes off both. These got foot to see these self if they wants foot to live. Braver than most, Key and I approached the old mirror and glared into the murky water. I swear, to this day, I've never seen water as dark. The face that looked back at me, a strange, warped version of my own, haunts me to this day. As for Key, he offered no description of what he saw there. Stepping away from the mirror, we scanned our immediate surroundings. Beyond a smattering of withered silver birches, a trail marked by a rusty chain-linked fence led to our destination. Tentatively, we approached, mindful of the eroding metal fencing poking up out of the gelatinous earth, sharp and menacing. Some fifteen paces further, and we were upon it. Blackened, charcoal-like trees loomed eerily above it, their poisoned limbs hanging limply, pointing towards the untold depths below. I still have difficulty describing it. Not in terms of outward appearance, as quite simply it was nothing more than a hole in the ground some fifteen feet in diameter. No, it was the unexplicable sensation that gnawed at my nerve endings and tugged at my faculties. That's what I have difficulty describing. To say that the urge to flee was overwhelming would have been an understatement. Staring into that black abyss evoked emotional responses unlike anything I've ever experienced. It was as though Key and I had discovered the eye of Mother Earth herself, and to look directly into it was a sin. A sin punishable by a fate worse than death. And, and we'd been warned. The folk who fell into sinkholes, the curious kids who mysteriously disappeared, the pets that strayed too far from their owners, all victims of whatever it was that roamed those unfathomable passageways at the bottom of that accursed pit. As the eye glared up at us, my thoughts returned to that peculiar reflection I gazed upon in the mirror. And then, there was movement below. I looked to Key and shivered. There was no conceivable way down into the pit, and as such, no conceivable way up out of it, was there? The movement came in the form of a sound, a shuffling, labored progression, the sound of frail ashen hands clutching blindly at the roots of dead trees. As the unsettling imagery sketched itself in my mind's eye with an incredible urgency, the all-consuming Grancid feeder grew in potency, so much so that I could almost taste it, my senses utterly assaulted by it. The clamor neared the surface, threatening to make eye contact with us in a matter of moments. Key and I stood, frozen to the spot, lips cracked, throats dry, inhaling the foul odor as it crept toward us. Seekers of the pit, the two of us, now sincerely regretting our inquisitiveness and impudence. As the nameless thing neared the surface, I turned and fled. Moments later, Key was at my rear. Heedless we were of the metal fragments strewn across the trail. Ignorant we were of the shadowy mirror and the boggy underfoot as we raced out of dogwood. Oblivious we were throughout the old bold hills. Unconcerned we were, as once again we plunged into the old ravine, passing Scooth's cottage and the silver birches. Thrilled we were as we made it into the safety of Park Road, gasping and collapsing to the merciful tarmac of a familiar thoroughfare. As Key and I walked home, not a single word was exchanged. 5. Key and I attended school together the following day, but Neither of us discussed the pit. That was our unspoken agreement, both secretly terrified, afraid that spoken acknowledgement of the thing we both knew was out there would confirm it, invite it, back into our lives. But our pact didn't last. It should have lasted till the end of our days. We bumped into each other 
some five years later at the bar in the painter's greyhound on a dreary autumn evening. The memories spilled out of us, and though several Audis were eavesdropping, none of them had a word to say. Like the church steeple at the heart of our town, one memory stood out above the rest, a memory both of us had attributed to the sordid weaving of a nightmare or a folie a deux. There in the quiet pub we described the strange sound and the hideous feeder that we sensed in the instant before we took flight. But as I spoke of the moment, I turned and fled. Key spoke of something else, something deplorable. From out of the pit had emerged the ashen hands and charcoal face of a long-dead miner. He claimed the very same face had replaced his reflection in the mirror. Its empty eyes studied him. As it pointed a pallid finger in his direction, it whispered, We are coming. It was with those fateful words Key had turned and fled. At the bar, his face fell, the color running out of it completely. He looked up at me then. They're coming for me, he muttered. I know it. The next day, I received a phone call. I recognized the caller as Daniel Tately, Key's younger brother. Daniel was morose, his voice but a whisper at the end of the line. There had been an incident at the Tately bungalow, one involving a sinkhole. I shuddered at the implications. The family had awoken in the early hours of the morning to a series of tremendous crashing sounds. Daniel and his parents, the latter of whom still refused to discuss the incident, rushed to Key's bedroom flung the door open and stood aghast as their son, brother, and my friend was dragged, kicking and screaming, into a gaping hole, malnourished ashen hands clutching at his head and arms. All this Daniel muttered in hushed tones. He spoke of Key's paranoia in the weeks leading up to the incident, an apparent preoccupation with the subterranean mines beneath our town, fears relating to the distant muffled sounds of pickaxes and the latent idea that a nameless thing from the heart of the mines had spent five long years searching for it. In his mind's eye, he had watched as it traversed the flooded depths, clearing collapsed corridors, looking for the precise location in which to dig hundreds of feet upwards. And he had listened as the encroaching clamor fueled his imagination, coupled with what Daniel referred to as an odor, an overpowering fetter that even the family had noticed in the days leading up to the incident. It got him, Daniel said. And it had. The occupants of the pit. Life in my town carries on. The few of us who remember such horrors exchange our tales in whispers over quiet ales at the painter's greyhound on the chilly nights. Occasionally, I revisit the fateful moment Key and I gazed into that old mirror. I saw myself. Key. Key saw something else. As my grandfather once said, Boy, tis nothing to look. Tis everything to see. See yourself, and know the escape the darkness. Now, I finally know what he meant. So yeah, you can sneer all you want at what the erudite and the cosmopolitan will call superstitions. In some cases, it might be just that. But... In the cases where someone ignores the signs, the rumors, the warnings, and even the blaring protests of their own intuition, there may be no one left to regret it. But there will always be those left to tell the stories. There are always stories. Stay scary, wildlings. Maybe pay a little more attention to what the locals have to say and make the most of your nights. <laughs>